I'm Leila Saad, and my life is driven by one burning question. How can I become a good ancestor? How can I create a legacy of healing and liberation for those who are here in this lifetime and those who will come after I'm gone? In my pursuit to answer this question, I'm interviewing changemakers and culture shapers who are also exploring that question for themselves in the way that they live and lead their life. It's my intention that these conversations will help you find your own answers to that question too. Welcome to Good Ancestor Podcast. Called a master of the genre by the New York Times, Sarah Jones is a Tony Award winning performer and writer known for her multi character, one person shows. These shows include the Broadway hit Bridge and Tunnel, originally produced by Oscar winner Meryl Streep and her current critically acclaimed show, Sell by Date. Renowned as a one-woman global village, she has given multiple main stage TED Talks, garnering millions of views, performed for President and First Lady Obama at the White House, and developed a docuseries based on her characters with Ron Howard's Imagine Entertainment. Sarah has also appeared in film and TV projects, ranging from Sesame Street to Broad City to the Oscar nominee, Marriage Story. Most recently, Sarah launched Foment Productions, a social justice focused entertainment company. Sell by Date, the play, which was commissioned by the Novo Foundation, was its first production. Hi, everybody. Today I'm joined by somebody who I've had the distinct pleasure of spending in person time with twice in less than a year. And now this is our our first in-depth conversation. Um, I'm talking about my friend, Sarah Jones. Welcome to Good Ancestor Podcast, Sarah. Thank you for having me, Layla. I'm a fan of the podcast, so this feels pretty great. Well, I'm a fan of you. (laughs) I'm a fan of you more broadly, too. Let's not get into the book and all the other things later. Yeah, yeah. So, Sarah, you, I, I just, I first want to say, I think this is going to be one of the most colorful and fun interviews I've probably ever done. Um, and we'll get into that and all the people you, I'm sure, will, who I'm sure will show up during this conversation. But before we start that, I want to ask you, who are some of the ancestors, living or transitioned, familial or societal, who have influenced you on your journey? I thought about this question because I know you ask it of everybody mm-hmm. and the answer, I'm going to say the answer whelmed me, whelmed in the sense that not overwhelmed, Yeah, you know, I, it didn't capsize me or anything, right. but a wave, a whelm is a wave that just washed over me and simultaneously kind of reminded me who I am and reminded me that I am, you know, kind of this tiny um, element of something so much bigger um, that has been passed along to me. I mean, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. I'm also standing on the, I think, surrendered selves of so many people. And I really thought about what good ancestor means. Like, what do I mean when I think about a good ancestor? And I, you know, I. Um, I'm a a writer and performer and and a talker, obviously, already, to those of you 30 seconds in. And one of my first thoughts was, how do I know what's good? What do I mean by good? How How am I evaluating? You know, is it a moral judgment? How do I know who was good? I have alcoholics and, you know, uh, people addicted to substances and all kinds of other folks, not just in my um, circle of ancestors creatively, who I think of, you know, whether it's a Billie Holiday or, uh, you know, people who this life was not easy for them and they made all kinds of, uh, whether you want to call them choices or, you know, had a path that was uh, a particular texture of a path. I have those folks in my creative influence, kind of, you know, this like crowd of ancestors and I have them in my family, like fairly close. I have complicated characters who some people might argue fall in the gray space between good and you know bad or whatever we would call not good and so i i I decided that my standard for good was going to be that they did the best they could with what they had at any moment and so by that standard honey the number of good ancestors i have will not fit 
in even, you know, if you do this podcast for the rest of your life, which I would love you to, if that's what you want to do, I don't know that they would all fit, but I'll start with, um, you know, in terms of a living ancestor, and this might be an obvious answer, but it's not my mom. My mom is someone who, uh, I would say that her, um, journey from being a 19 year old who gave birth to me, Mm. uh, married my dad at 18, um, really out of a moral sense that if she wanted to be with somebody, um, um, for those of you who can't, who are not watching, I'm giving you the eyebrow of what be with means. <laughs> um, if she wanted to be with someone, she had to marry them for the rest of her life at 18 years old, a, a barely a formed person. Mm. Um, I think about the fact that the brain, I think we now know the prefrontal cortex doesn't fully develop in an adult until like 25 or something. Yeah. So I'm like, this child married my dad, who was also sort of still a child, and they made me. And that alone, that those two ancestors alone, doing the best they could with what they had, yeah, everything. So anyway, that's that's an initial answer to um, some of the good ancestors. I could go on and on about Gil Scott Heron. We were just talking about some really early work of mine. He's an ancestor who's passed on, and who's a complicated figure, and a bit was a big influence on my early. Um, life in in the arts, so so many people, you know, you you're in my lifetime, Layla. I'll maybe get to tell you everybody. Oh. <laughs> I love that you say it's complicated, though, and I think that really speaks to um, a lot of how I see you perceiving, you know, my work because that's how we got to know each other was through me and White Supremacy the, when it was in its workbook form. Workbook. Right. But then also getting to know each other and getting to know you, your background, your history, and you come from a very multi-racial, multi-ethnic family. And you, like myself, don't easily fit into people's boxes. I always really identify with people who are, you know, third culture kids. So people who are raised in a culture that's not the culture of their parents. And I often find that those people, because they don't really feel like they fit anywhere, they feel like they fit everywhere, and we sort of recognize each other. I don't know if you um, identify as a third culture kid, but certainly having, you know, I imagine you sitting at the, at the family table and there's all these different characters. I mean, tell us a little bit about your family, your kind of background, and how that has influenced who you are, who the, the ancestor that you're living as. Yeah. So I told you that my parents, I mean, we went way back all of a sudden, my parents, <laughs> uh, university students. What I didn't tell you is not only were they very young, but they were, you know, a, a, a white skinned woman and a black skinned man at the time that my parents, first of all, my mom was one of the first women allowed to live on campus at uh, the university they went to, Johns Hopkins. So she was integrating on a gender level. And then, um, you know, my dad was a part of the first group, critical mass of black people ever mm -hmm. assembled on that campus. I think there were like 12 of them or something, or, you know, at 30 out of 1500 or 2000. So when I say critical mass, don't, you know, don't get, don't the get idea. Too excited. <laughs> right. Don't count more than your fingers and toes really. But and my mom is, so my grandmother on my mom's side is Irish, was Irish American and German American. I grew up with both uh, Christian and Jewish relatives on that side of the family. I am black from a distance. So if you can't see me, I'm giving you some context here um, that I am of multicultural extraction and black identification. Mm -hmm. And that was very confusing since my mother was not a woman of color. Right. Now, my grandfather though, my mother's father, is a man of color and his family from the Caribbean, from, I have uh, Dominican cousins. I grew up around all of that, mm -hmm. but I was confused and recently got to tell my mom on camera in an interview, I did not have any concept that she was anything other than pink mommy. Right. You know, so asked me at one point, you know, my, uh, dad is brown, mommy is pink. Right. And I didn't understand her multicultural experience as a white appearing person who's white. mixed. Right, right, right. Yeah. So white that it, and I, I you know, part of me is like, oh, I, I am cringing because she's going to hear this. And I don't think she liked, she did, you know, it's such a complicated world when a uh, race becomes, this construct becomes such a firm one. 
yeah. that it does, you know, shape our identities. And so I would just say that my family, you know, I grew up, <laughs> this lady here, hi there, hi Layla, sweetheart. We met in Los Angeles. That's right. One. Yes, we did. For me and white supremacy, the book. That's I'm still right. working on it. Apparently, I can't solve uh, white supremacy all by myself, as it turns out. But I can do my little part. Anyway, my name is Lorraine, and Sarah would tell you that I'm loosely based on a real relative of hers. You know, I think she. The joke is that she changes the names to protect the innocent, <laughs> especially the guilty. <laughs> anyway, that's Lorraine. She's you know loosely based on and, real relative. Just pause for a minute because there is some people who are listening on audio and they're about to think somebody else just walked in the room there. So give social distancing. There's nobody here but Sarah. <laughs> it's Sarah. It's still Sarah. That my husband, I, I, I told you we were driving and I got him to listen to you doing your, your, your characters. And he's like, wait, this is all the same person? I'm like, this is all the same person. Sarah, tell us what just happened there. So what happens there is I grew up like, you know, surrounded by the voices of people from different backgrounds. They were my family. They were my people. They didn't look like me necessarily. And sometimes we didn't even see eye to eye. I mean, as I got older, that really created conflict. But when I was little, all I knew was these voices were kind of um, a, a very normal part of how I understood the world. And they were right next to me, especially at holidays when everybody was together. So you would also get kind of like a relative who, you know, speaking like this auntie, what there was aunties and uncles from all the different backgrounds. And I had no expectation that if I'm talking to you and I don't sound like you, you're going to listen to me. So I made sure, Hey, whoever I'm talking to, I'm yours for the moment. Yeah. We're going to be from the Caribbean for right now. And then I'm going to switch back over and sound like this cousin over here who's from Long Island and, you know, like different. So I started to pick that up in my family. And then I went off to school where there was even more multicultural. I mean, I told you, Layla, when I met you and when, especially when I read your bio, I thought, oh, she, we would have been yeah. school. Yeah. You were a normal type, me, you know, that's yeah. the norm. Yeah. Um, that you multi, you know, at multi-ethnic, multi hyphen it yeah. uh, identity. And like you said, fitting everywhere and nowhere at the same time was a very normal feeling for me. And part of it was especially how people sounded, but also their mannerisms. But for me, it was like music, you know, the same way a child might take lessons, piano or something. I was just kind of taking the world in. in um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I will say this as well. It was, there was a way in which not feeling like I belonged was very painful. And so I think there was a healing balm in, uh, you know, when I got, I, I got to the point where I was able to speak like this, you know, my mates around me would say, oh my God, are you from England? And I would think for a moment, should I tell them I am? Why not? Let's do it. You know, it was sort of like, at the time, I think I was hiding. I think, yeah. I, I know I was. I, it's still something that I grapple with as a, as a wanting to be a good ancestor now. Who is my authentic self? And I think then, as my identity was forming, there were times when I responded um, as almost somebody else out of pain. Mm -hmm. And then I learned gradually to come from an authentic place that just happens to have all of these facets that are me. Are you? So what I'm hearing is, you, this sort of, I mean, you, you grew up in this very multi-ethnic, multi-racial family and environment. So you were hearing these voices and, you know, we could have grown up in the same environment and heard it differently in the sense that I might not have been able to then do what you did with it, right? To pick up the voices and be able to actually run with it. Because you, you have siblings. Yes. Have they... Okay. Yeah. So do they do the, the voices, the characters? Right. He plays piano though. And I think the music, I think the same part of our brains was constantly stimulated. Yeah. That, and that the same part processes language and, you know, these different sounds and melody and harmony. Yeah. And I have pitch. I love to sing that for me, they're very connected. The yeah. kind of hearing 
you know, being able to hear like a lilt or like a very specific tone and how it would sound and how does it come out of your throat? For me, there is a direct connection there between, you know, having Dominican cousins or yeah. that family and hearing the music of that culture. It's very connected. It's the same connected, part of my brain. Yeah. But so I, I feel like one part of it and I, I didn't, you, I can't play Yeah. It. You interpret, you, you interpreted it differently and, and, and used it differently. Um, but I love what you said about how for a very long time, that was that feeling of not belonging was actually a cause of pain and wounding for you. And that this developed, it sounds like as a coping mechanism first, but has now become something that you, I mean, it's clearly your, your purpose. It's your passion. It's, you alchemized it into something different. It went beyond just, this is for Sarah into, this is something that fills me up and this is something that I serve the world with. Um, what happened in between those two places from coping mechanism to walking in my purpose? Yeah. I mean, I would say a lot, like a, I'm sure a lot. <laughs> And like a lot of young girls and young women around the world, I, I, but I, you know, my experience was, again, being sort of this multicultural, black identified young woman in an era of, you know, the explosion of hip hop. Um, I lived in New York City. My, a lot of my family's from New York. I'm from Queens, which is one of the most diverse, I think it's the most diverse borough on the planet, like in terms of a one community. I think something like 180 languages are spoken or, you know, wow. however, it's, it's, a, it's, I'm getting the numbers not quite right, but pretty much it is a microcosm of the globe. Right. And that's in terms of class as well as, mm. uh, culture, you know, and, and, cultures, culture right. and, and so the, the mix is very potent. Mm. Um, it is an opportunity for incredible, um, unity and shared vision and you know filipino kids with hip-hop you know like it was it was wonderful and there was tension there was tension um there was a there were huge racial clashes um among you know white americans um who i you know did not want to identify with black people and it was just there, so there was a, a, a mix that um really constantly caused me to ask who am i um, am I the chick on the dance floor, you know, as a teenager, we would go to clubs really early, actually, sorry, mom. Um, and, you know, kind of be there dancing next to like some of the rappers who were on the radio. And how do I, who am I in that moment? Do I want to be um, sought for, you know, how I look and valued for that? You know, what's my identity in that space? Mm. Um, there were so many things kind of, there were so many opportunities uh pulling at me right opportunities that that were uh again sort of that stretch of growing pain and nothing about this was tidy it was a messy process i really feel like i was it was, uh, it was a human process it was a human process thank yeah. you and I, I, one of the things i work on now is self-judgment and criticism yeah. and how often my tendency is to you know kind of um uh, harshly view what's actually just human mm -hmm. to have an expectation of, you know, something more pristine than the messiness that is life. Right. And because there was pain, I have a tendency to think, Oh, did I do that wrong? And I think what I was doing was again, the best I could with what I had at any given time. But so there I was kind of moving through, I would uh, be speaking French with my French friends and then, you know, uh, the black kids would come by from, uh, you know, Queens or something like that. And I would just change up real quick, you know, oh yeah, blah, blah, blah. You know, like I would just, I was like, ah! like, I didn't know, who, you know, was I this like Euro kid listening to like, you know, Depeche Mode and The Cure and all of this stuff? Or did I love, you know, A Tribe Called Quest? Yes. The yeah. answer was yes. I loved it all. And um, I think it was, there was a lot of, you know, I had um, challenges in my family home um, growing up that I'm still learning how to talk about those in a way that is loving and, um, um, you know, makes space for my experience while acknowledging that some folks are still not ready to talk about certain mm -hmm. things. Um, but I, without being too vague, I'll say my experience included profound losses and trauma. Mm. And I'm thinking about that in, you know, my very, very much adult life, how the, 
challenges of my childhood continue to um, color how I see everything unless I really look at them squarely. Um, and I think that even my good ancestors, most of my good ancestors didn't have the tools or weren't given the permission. Yeah. Uh, it sort of wasn't the environment in which to look at one's life and say, oh, you know, these are some choices I'm making that are hurting me or the people around me. And I think um, as a kid, I certainly had no language and no tools. So I was basically like just running around, flinging it around. And by it, I mean me, us, this. Yeah. Whatever this was, I was like, oh, you want to let me into a party for free where amazing culture is happening because, you know, you like the way I look? Excellent. I'm going with that plan. Until I discovered feminism and kind of found myself grappling with conflict, you know, within myself around that and mm. uh, my own contradictions. So I would say between um, a burgeoning feminism and a, and a longstanding but evolving awareness of multiculturalism, the need for social justice movements. Um, I grew up, Gil Scott Heron was sort of my uncle. He was one of those first, um, that first core group of African Americans. Um, he was a grad student while my dad was an undergrad. And so Uncle Gil was kind of a part of my, you know, cultural memory, even as a little kid. And, and I was surrounded- And for those not who, who don't know, who is Gil oh, yeah. Scott Heron? So Gil Scott Heron was, uh, he's passed away now. He was a poet. Uh, and a writer, a novelist. He actually was a um, multifaceted writer and professor and um, kind of cultural teacher of of millions, actually, because he got into music. And um, if people are familiar with the phrase, the revolution will not be televised, if you've ever heard that anywhere in an ad or somewhere, he originated that phrase. He wrote uh, poetry. Um, I think his first big album was Small Talk on 125th Street. He was a Black cultural icon. Right. Um, a lot of people in the 1970s. And then he had a resurgence, as happens, um, with my generation, you know, coming along behind him as part of the spoken word movement that I was part of. Yeah. We all listened to Gil Scott Heron as one of our, he was like a beacon. Right. Um, my generation. And I got, I got really fortunate that something he wrote inspired me to write something yes. and I ended up going on tour with him. Wow. Uh, well, I was, yeah. So I was saying to Sarah before we hit record that I was, you know, in doing my research of Sarah, um, stumbled across your poem, um, uh, Your Revolution, um, which I clicked and started watching and was like, hold on a minute. I have seen this years and years ago. And I remember thinking it was amazing, not realizing this is the same Sarah who is your friend. <laughs> and it was just like this amazing moment. And, you know, you, you started, it seems, your, using your voice in that way through poetry. Yes. Through poetry. It has now evolved. You've, you use it in different ways. You are really well known for your one woman shows. And that's quite different to poetry. So how did how did that switch happen, um, and and when did the characters started started coming through you and want to be in their own show? Yes. Yeah. When when did they take over and start uh -huh. living living rent free? Uh -huh. right? No, they they earn their keep. I think. Um, I would say that my time at there were a few formative moments. I um, didn't finish college, and I don't always tell that story, but I think it's important to say. Uh, I was going through enough in my, you know, um, kind of uh, adult, adolescent into adult transition mm -hmm. that I did not have everything I needed to be able to finish college. And I went to a wonderful school, a women's school here um, in the U.S., uh, Bryn Mawr College, shout out to Bryn Mawr, where I got enough of an education to know something was going on with me. And mm -hmm. I left school. I you know, I didn't drop out. Rather, I, I, you this, I, 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 I deferred uh, okay. indefinitely for a, <laughs> a, a, an infinite period of linear, non-linear, <laughs> lifelong learning. That's, that's what I'm doing. I'm still, I'm still a junior. I think I can, <laughs> I've gone back and performed multiple times. So I think all is all good. I think they've cleared it up with you. It's fine. <laughs> it, worked it worked out. But, um, 
uh, I was there and kind of, again, sort of, you know, finding my way. And I was writing, um, you know, I was, I was an English major, double major English and philosophy. So I was thinking about all these things and I was marinating in hip hop and, and in, um, which is so connected to spoken word and yes. uh, slam poetry, if, if people are familiar with that. This idea of the words being so enlivened by the performance that they're different than anything you could read on a page. Exactly. They have their own, their, their own performed life, right? And so uh, I, when I came home from college during that period of not knowing what I wanted to do, I started going to the New Eurekan Poets Cafe and the Brooklyn Moon Cafe, lots of cafes, so many cafes. And uh, these were places where you could go and hear people of multiple backgrounds um, from all over the world at mm -hmm. times. I mean, I remember hearing, uh, you know, uh, in one evening, Puerto Rican poets, Palestinian, uh, you know, people from Japan who's mm -hmm. like, um, you know, English was their second language. And yet the, that, that was part of you know, the beauty of the experience was perhaps broken English mixed with Japanese. It was so powerful to me. Yeah. And it spoke to both my hip hop sensibility and po loving poetry and writing. Mm. And I started doing that. And I was really, I think I was mimicking other people's styles as you do when you're finding your way. Right. And then, right. And then at one point I realized, and I, I will say I was coming into my blackness in a new way. I was one of those people who was like, oh my God, you can sleep with a thing on your head. Like I just didn't know anything. You know, my mom washed our hair with like the white lady shampoo when I was growing up. So I didn't know nothing. People were like, um, do you know what ashy means? I was like, what's that? Like, <laughs> um, but, uh, sorry, mom. But, sorry, not sorry. We've had this conversation. We've had this. <laughs> but, uh, I think I found my truth when I started letting the little multicultural voices leak out. So instead of instead of trying to be Erica Badu standing at the mic and making my voice like this with a big head wrap and some incense, y'all, and an accent that was fun for me but wasn't my truth, you know, all of a sudden I was like, well, let me be my Caribbean relatives. Let me be, you know, my Jewish great aunt. Let me be these people on stage and not fear that it will make me uncool because I don't sound, I don't have that cadence when you are doing the spoken word and snapping your fingers to the beat. You know, like that was part yeah, of me. That was the whole, that was the whole vibe. That was it. You nailed it. Yeah, that was the whole vibe. So, and not to make fun of those, you know, there was- No, no, no. Yeah. That, but I think I was trying to limit myself to fit, yeah. right? And I wasn't fitting. I was, I was sort of running over the sides. And that's when I found, oh, I can write mo monologues. The first one I ever wrote was, oh, the homeless, a, la a lady that lived on the street mm -hmm. and um, didn't have no teeth on the top. And she came right through me. I will never forget it. I was, in a I was doing a performance and this woman who I'd been seeing on the subway just came through me. And I know she's also got to be parts of, you know, uh, black female relatives, older yeah. relatives. I have. Yeah. So that I was like, okay, I, something's happening here that I cannot control. I can't, it was a struggle because I want to look good all the time. That's a real thing mm -hmm, that came mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, sort of an addiction to approval, you know, and that, I think that drove my, you know, going to my relatives and talking to them like them or going to my, ich muss mein Deutsch gelernt, you know, I like all, whatever, all my like, I'm going to learn perfect German and perfect everything and perfect everything. And then everybody will love me and I'll be okay. Yeah. And I think there was something in there that was um, both tugging at me and releasing me at the same time. And I, it was a constant mm -hmm. dance of how do I let go of you know, external approval and keep coming home to this feeling, this warm feeling of self-approval as I let these characters take up space mm -hmm. in me. And that's, yeah. okay, so this is what fascinates me about you, Sarah, out of all the things, right, is that, so a lot of my own personal journey, especially over these last few years, has been about learning how to define myself for myself, something that Audre Lord you know, wrote about, spoke about, really embodied and lived within herself. And oftentimes I think of it as this, you know, one true self that's within that we're trying to make that connection with. Now we have someone like you who has all of these different characters taking up residence inside. Um, and they are so different, but they're not at the same time. 
And, and so when you think about that defining yourself for yourself, so you talked about you're coming into yourself, you're learning how to release external, you know, the need for external validation, learning how to be within yourself and really love and accept yourself for yourself while this whole thing is happening and you're learning how to relax so that these characters can come through you. How do you, how have you, you know, over the years learned to conceptualize who am I, Sarah, with all of these different moving pieces and, and people? Yeah, I would, the f- first thought I'm having is, it's definitely ongoing. This is not a past oh, tense. Absolutely. Yes, uh, yes. And, uh, I find the characters themselves help me. I mean, I, this, this young woman. Hi, my name's Bella. I've met you too, Layla. We have met Bella. <laughs> honor such a total honor um but like you know like sarah jones has like all of these people in her and like i encourage her to just like like yeah let's just like let's just like go for it like you know like allow she's always using the word allow to other people but then like when it comes to herself she's like not allowed <laughs> and so i think we're there to be like yeah like you are like soups allowed to like do whatever you need to do um i think like <laughs> bella <laughs> is uh i have an inner bella like i ha- and i have an inner uh you know there's a character uh who's very controversial for me who i, I met uh really through uh doing some research i stumbled upon these white uh men uh i hesitate even to be able to call myself a man she's got all these other things that she says now cis cis male i don't know what she's talking about calling me names but the point is uh uh, when i sit my name is hank when i sit down and talk to sarah jones it's you know i don't enjoy it i don't uh, expect to reason with her she Mm -hmm. has all her things that she believes about black life matters and what my life doesn't matter you know i just i don't like to sit down and talk to her but we do and, uh, you know, we're going through a time, especially when, uh, I just don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear what she has to say, but, uh, do I listen a little bit? I let a little bit in and I think about something more, you know, that I enjoy, uh, while she talks, but, uh, you know, we do sit down when we do. I, you know, I have, I have. Uh, an entry point. There's a portal onto Hank that I don't know that I want. Right. I don't know that I want it. It's un- very uncomfortable for me to feel so much empathy for him when I disagree. When I personally, as a writer, as a performer, dis- I really disagree with what the impact I think a person like this is having on his world and my world. Mm-hmm. And yet, you know, my job is to um, clear space, keep clearing space, keep. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a prayer I love and I'm not, a, I'm not a religious person, uh, per se, but I am, I, I'm an open skeptic and I think I'm a spiritual person in the sense that I know that I'm not just this body. Yeah. I know that, you know, art moves me someplace that's not just about the goosebumps that appear on my skin. It's about mm-hmm. something internal that I don't totally understand. So as a spiritual person, I believe Hank has a spirit. Yeah. Uh, what, you know, what he's doing with that spirit is kind of none of my business and I can't control it. Yes. And there's something about um, letting the characters do whatever they're going to do that requires me to let go of approval seeking. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't manage it all the time. There mm-hmm. are times, when, and especially as my career developed, I did, you know, find myself in spaces that were rarefied. Um, I grew up with that illusion of hierarchy, even though, you know, the U.S. is ostensibly a democracy. Let's all just put that one to bed. I mean, come on. This is a, you know, stratified class system, um, just like anywhere else. And it's more insidious because it's, it's, it's much more difficult to sort of discern between someone who sounds like this. And, you know what I mean? Like in, uh, the, the illusion of class mobility is very convincing here. Mm. And for me, select few people it is it has some true aspects like my family in fact when you were talking about being a third culture okay. person yeah. in some ways my third culture is class uh like i am from a, a solidly middle class experience mm. uh, both my parents are doctors i you know went to uh, certain schools and all this kind of thing and and working class roots 
Like my, my roots are decidedly not when my friends were skiing and all this, I was like, uh, does anyone want to play double Dutch with like a free rope made out of a clothesline? Like I had never, I had skied. I did not, you know, so all of this to say, I think the approval that I was seeking on so many levels, how can I be good enough? How can I be authentic enough? How can I be lovable enough? Sometimes the balance would get out of whack where I thought, as long as I'm good enough, I don't have to be authentic. As long as, you know, Mm -hmm. powerful people approve of me, I will, you know, um, I will receive whatever it is I think they need to give me for me to be okay. Never knowing that everything I needed was within me mm. and the only thing required of me was self-approval. The only, mm. truly, like I think it's, is it Nayara Waid, maybe the, uh, the poet uh, said something like if, um, oh God, I'm going to butcher it now, but the sentiment is something along the lines of, you know, if I uh, approve of myself, Um, uh, if I'm waiting for you to approve of me, the world is nothing but endings. But if I approve of myself, you know, uh, the world never ends. Something, I'm so sorry, Nayara. That's no, that's, (laughs) and we hope it is Nayara. But that feeling of grasping outside myself, there's a great story about a diamond thief who's seeking this diamond, and you know, there's a, a a person who's got this diamond and the thief is so skilled and he's trying to steal this diamond from this guy. He, it's the most precious thing in the world and blah, blah, blah. And he's trying, trying, trying over, you know, a long journey to get this diamond from this guy. He's used all his best techniques and he just can't get it. Yeah. And he's like, well, he finally stops the guy after three days of chasing him and says, why can't I'm the best? How, why can't I find this diamond? And he says, I hid it in the one place you will never look your own pocket. Mm. And that is the feeling that yeah. I am carrying immeasurable wealth, safety, comfort, you know, everything I'm seeking right here in my yeah. own pocket, the last place I look. Right. So that, that's the journey with the characters, my, my writing, my career, my, yeah. um, you know, decisions about how I want to be perceived. I didn't pursue the music career that could have been there for me. I like went on tour with that song, Your Revolution. It was yeah. everywhere for a while. I got in trouble and like got censored for it. I, at one I read about that. Uh huh. So all of a sudden I was getting like interviewed by Rolling Stone magazine alongside like Eminem. I was like, what is going on? Like, right. What's happening? But I didn't, I remember not quite knowing who I was, who I wanted to be. I didn't want to be pigeonholed as like a, you know, pornographic rapper, which is mm-hmm. what people used me with, whatever that means, right? That's just taking away uh, a black woman like Foxy Brown or Little Kim, taking away her right to her sexuality, right? By right, putting her right. in the box. But I was so fearful of like, but I'm an intellectual and I don't want to be, you know, put in this whole, this kind of pigeonhole or this pigeonhole. Right. I was letting other people define me so much of the time. Mm. And I I mean, when I say letting other people define me, I I don't just mean the roles that I was being offered as an actor or, you know, kind of very stereotyped roles. Always. And I mean, it was, you could count them on my five fingers because they were the same tropes that we recognize from white supremacy down through history for white women. So that misogyny that's baked into the white supremacy there, the, the, you know, kind of oversexed Jezebel, Mm -hmm. the, um, you know, ace. Sassy best friend? Sassy best friend. Honey, my head was spinning from the sassy best friend. I mean, I needed a chiropractor for my wiggle and neck for the sassy best friend. And then, uh, you know, the um, magical negress. Mm -hmm. uh, You know, I love Oprah and I'm so grateful for her. But for a lot of people, she was like this, you know, archetype of the... um, I don't know, that that unfortunate... The the sage, the the one who comes in with it. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. And who has no self, no personhood really, right. but is there to dispense endless wisdom for white people. Right, right. And um, there was the, uh, you know, the kind of um, morally debased, you know, woman of some form. So, you know, whether she was addicted to drugs, which is of course not a health issue, but a moral issue, right? Right. Make a criminal. Right. Uh, 
I'm a terrible criminal who leaves her kids or whatever, all just moralizing, 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 attacking black womanhood all over the place. When, as everybody knows, we the only ones who's gonna save this damn place. If everybody just listen to us, we wouldn't be in this fucking mess. Excuse my language, we wouldn't be in this mess. <laughs> Anyway, the anger comes out when I think about it. <laughs> the queens just jumped out there. <laughs> it, really, it really did. I'm so sorry about the cursing. But, um, sorry, Layla. Oh, you're good. You're good. I mostly managed to contain it, but ooh, sometimes. <laughs> anyway, and uh, what were the, some of the other? The tragic, the tragic mulatto. Right, uh, right. You know, the, the, something tragic, something that mm-hmm. both managed to rob us of the truth of mm-hmm. our of our complicated and very painful experience as mm-hmm. the African diaspora, especially in America. Well, not especially in America, the African diaspora, period. Period, right. Uh, period. Um, my experience of especially in America was mm-hmm. um, noticing how African Americans were treated around me at, in comparison to some of my more international friends who mm-hmm. were of African descent mm-hmm. and yet had a slightly different experience, mm-hmm. but sometimes set apart as model black minorities right right sort of, oh well you're haitian you're from the caribbean i get that sometimes right you know this notion that we are different um and you know it's always divide and conquer right, right. So it's yeah. well 100 percent. and there's there's a there's a million different games that are played right that white supremacy plays to divide us among ourselves to have us fighting with each other and it, so that we're distracted from what's really going on um, so yeah, and I can imagine as somebody with multiple identities sitting in different spaces, depending on the context of the space that you're in, how you are then boxed in, defined, you know, changes all the time, which is very hard when you're trying to define who you are for you, you know, understanding that anywhere I go into any space, I'm me, Sarah, and that's what this means, while at the same time being aware of the different positionalities you hold when it comes to, you know, privileges and, and so forth. Um, but what, you know, what I, as you were talking about different role, these stereotypical roles that you were being offered, right. As a, as an artist and you, you, you didn't, you didn't go down that route. You said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to trust my gut and I'm going to forge my own path. What you have done has been so unique. These one woman show, one woman shows that you do with these different characters. I mean, I don't even know how many you have. <laughs> it seems like a lot of <laughs> different ages, genders, nationalities, um, personalities that you have been able to say, you know what? You can't find a place for me to be. I'm going to make my own space for me. Yes. That is powerful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It is powerful. I take that. I receive that. Thank you. And uncomfortable. Yeah. And, so and, let's you know, talk about that because that is something that in my own journey is that I've definitely found, you know, um, my journey with my mentor, Dr. Frantonia has taught me that they're, they're, in order to have sovereignty, over our lives, we also have to have responsibility for ourselves. And having responsibility, complete total responsibility, in my experience, has been one of the most uncomfortable things (laughs) that I've ever experienced. So, you know, a lot of times people see the success. So you're, you know, a Tony award-winning actress. You've been featured in all of these places and things. You know, some of your very close friends are people that we consider icons. And yet, your day-to-day life, you know, you're navigating, how do I, how do I stay in me? And how do I, you know, continue to hold responsibility over my life? Talk to us a little bit about that, you know, because it is a journey and it's yes. an ongoing one. Yes, it is. It, you know, I'm wearing, for people who can't uh, see, I'm wearing a shirt that says fed up. And I started making these many years ago because, because of really the politics that, you know, um, I thought were so anathema to my, to, to humanity. I just thought, yeah. you know, this is such an, such a white supremacist. We did, I mean, and the language at that time, if you had said white supremacy, people could only picture, you know, Ku Klux Klan members. It wasn't this, there wasn't this sense that the entire system mm. under we live is shot through with this 
um, you know, kind of hatred. It's a, it's a, it's hatred. Um, and so I've had this, I, I remember wearing this shirt on stage with Jill Scott Heron. And unfortunately it has not gone, it, ha it has only become more relevant to feel this sense of this is unacceptable to me. And yet I'm in spaces where I have to pretend that this is acceptable just to get into the room. If yeah. I come in with a protest sign I'm really wearing inside, I can't enter this space and begin to dismantle, you know, master's house with his own tools, right? Yeah. So there's this, I feel like I have a multi-pronged approach to living, which is to uh, check in with myself, come home to myself, wear this shirt, feel fed up and let people say, Oh, what do you have to be fed up about? You, you know, you seem fine or feel my own, um, internal contradictions as I, I mean, my, one of my mentors, Meryl Streep, you know, her name is synonymous with greatness. And, uh, and I had this expectation of who I should now have to be. And I felt so much pressure, you know, if I make a, a you know, if I don't, uh, have the most amazing career in the world, Meryl would be disappointed in me. You know, I had, I felt so much pressure, self-imposed, by the way. Meryl's yeah. fine. She does right. not. <laughs> um, right. Of, um, you know, kind of constriction and fear and uh, managing, fixing, controlling. That is actually the opposite of my art. And so I had to learn slowly but surely on my journey through Hollywood and turning down roles that I believe me to this day, I'm like, boy, I'd have a lot more money now if I had said yes, even three or four of those times that right. instead I, and sometimes I was in my own way. Sometimes there was a project that I thought, God, everyone here is a, you know, well-intended liberal, but racist, you know, uh, sexist white man and doesn't even know it. They're like my producers, my this, my that. They think they're great. I'm acting kind of like they're great. I'm not going to go to them and be like, hey, guess what? You're actually a white supremacist misogynist. <laughs> I know you love my work, but you just grabbed me around the waist in front of a whole bunch of people and said how cute I am. You know, uh, so, you know, navigating all of that and then uh -huh. going home and feeling like, oh, I should have been more Audre Lorde. I should have you know, been able to stand up for myself better in that moment. And I'm talking about a couple of years ago. I'm not talking about mm -hmm. the very beginnings of my career. I'm talking about the me too of it all, my mm -hmm. experience, everyone's experiences of what oppression and internalized oppression can manifest in an artist's life or in a, in a yeah. person's life. We're all artists, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, this is a long meandering way to get to, I find it is daily work every morning I have to wake up and sometimes, like I said, I'm not religious, but I am aware that there's something much greater than me, something, whether it's art or beauty or love or truth, something that is bigger than my, you know, kind of vicissitudes as a, a very imperfect, lovable and imperfect person who will sometimes be like, how big is a check? You know, if, they, if it's going to pay my rent, yes, I will do a commercial for this brand that I don't believe in. That, you know, that is a, that is a fight that I um, struggle with mm -hmm. to this day. Um, and I would say that I have not managed it perfectly. There have been times when I've shrunk and hidden um, and made myself smaller. There's an expression, uh, under being, under earning and under being. Mm -hmm. I've, done that. I've kind of shrunk and hidden my own light. I've had people say, you're so this and so that. Why are you not a household name? Why don't I know you? And this, it's a complicated answer. Um, I, I have made choices to uh, be my authentic self that have sometimes, you know, required me to stay smaller than I would really like to be. I want to share my gifts as widely as they can be helpful. Mm. And I don't know how to do that either. Yeah. And, and I thank you just for bringing your full humanity to this conversation, because that is something that is very important to me, it's a conversation that I've learned to have with myself um, as somebody who was a chronic overachiever, uh, perfectionist, um, seeking everybody's validation, but even when I got it, still felt completely empty, uh, you know, all of it. And a conversation that I um, have been taught, mentored to have with myself is, 
this is you showing up in your full humanity. Your full humanity means you're, you're all of these amazing things and you have this shadow as well and you have these wounds and you have these places in which, you know, you're tender or you're scared or you're stuck and it's all you and it's all the truth. Um, and that is absolutely a lifelong journey. I think this idea that we, you know, that, you know, there's that expression, let me, you know, once I get my shit together, you know, nobody's going to be able to stop me. And it's like, what does that mean? <laughs> because I think what it means is once I've got everything perfectly lined up, like that single moment when everything lines up, then the whole world is going to be open to me and then nothing can go wrong after that. And, you know, you, you reach certain mountaintops and you, you're like, wow, I can't believe that I wished for this to happen. It has happened. And I'm still me. Yes. I'm yes. still, I'm still, I'm on the mountaintop and I'm still me. And I still got to be in relationship with me and the wholeness of who I am. And that is something that is, is an ongoing journey. Um, and I want to take this, I kind of want to swing this conversation around because I think this is a perfect point to talk about it. You have, you are, you are a very vocal feminist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a lot of your, you know, what I see you sharing in your messages, in your work, you know, what you share online as well as, as in your actual work are around, you know, things that you are thinking about in your journey as a woman specifically yeah. and how systems of oppression, you know, give you mixed messages about the type of woman you should be or what it means to be a woman or how we should be women. And what does it mean to be a feminist? Um, it seems to me as sort of an, uh, an outside observer that your journey as a feminist is a place of fuel and passion and power. Yes. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about, about that? You know, that's a, so that's another, I'm remembering back to the first one person show I did. Uh, you know, someone, well, it's the, kind of details are not super important, but a white man was making more money than I could for doing the same thing that I knew how to do. Mm. And I knew that I was, however, you know, dysfunctional I felt inside, I had total clarity that when I was on stage doing what I did, I had a certain ability that moved people. I, people would tell me and I could feel it. Yeah. And so there was no doubt there about the quality of what I was doing. Mm. And yet the, um, I would sort of be held up as like a, you know, oh, well, you're a woman and you're diverse. So we're going to put you on our cover of this, but we're not going to pay you. We're not going to pay you. And, and I remember that tokenism in me and white supremacy. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Tokenism. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And sometimes I need a refresher on my <laughs> while back out. Anyway. Um, I would, uh, you know, I, rem I, made, I made these shirts. I remember making these shirts with my, my director at the time was a Puerto Rican woman. And the two of us, you know, as a, a Puerto Rican, Gloria Feliciano, I want to name her. She was a playwright, is a playwright and a director, very skillful, brilliant, and would be reduced to, oh, you and your cute little Puerto Rican director lady. And I wanted to be like, if I were, if this were a man, a white man, standing next to me doing the same work mm. no one would be diminishing you know his culture his accomplishments his gender um and so and anyway we both she wore the shirt we all wore the shirt we just walked around like i am fed up of this it was kind of a way of expressing and i, st I swear i wear it now and every once in a while i worry like oh people are gonna think i'm angry i'm an angry feminist and an angry black woman and an angry black woman. And I remember I wore it. It was, it was part of my costume while I performed Your Revolution. And I was a, uh, the character I played on stage was a young woman standing at the bus stop in Queens, you know, with not enough money to have her own car, but a guy pulls up in a huge Jeep. Mm -hmm. At the time, this was the trend. The bass was, you know, like shaking the whole block. And he kind of would pull up, hey, ma. Yeah, it was good, ma. That's my character, Rashid. Poor baby. I'm gonna. He's he's not gonna appreciate this because he has evolved since then. But yeah, it was good. You know what I'm saying? What you doing? You waiting for the bus? Why you gonna wait for the bus? You wasting all that time? You know, don't waste time. Come get in the car with me. Blah blah blah. So she has this conversation, this back and forth with this guy, and her whole monologue is about her 
nascent feminism. Mm. And she was really expressing what I felt, which was, this is confusing. I want to enjoy what Bell Hooks calls adornment and, you know, uh, beauty. And I want to enjoy my lipstick. I remember being at Bryn Mawr and it was like, don't wear lipstick. Don't do that. You're like a, you know, the lipstick is like, you know, if we're running around saying death to the patriarchy and then you're putting lipstick on, that doesn't work. And okay. I was like, well, can we have death to the patriarchy and the lipstick? Because I like both. I love my earrings. Oh, don't do that. And I'd be like, yeah, but you're a white girl who doesn't understand my earrings. This is pre uh, Sarah Jessica Parker, you know, uh, helping us all get these appropriated into the rest of the culture. <laughs> but, you know, I still wear them. I still wear the same earrings I wore in like eighth grade because like, hip you know it all meant something to me so right. can i have a joan morgan is one of my living ancestors who i love she's you know not much older than i am but she's a feminist who wrote um when chicken heads come home to roost yeah. and you know thinking about my feminism my um being a black woman my being a person of multicultural heritage and identity how do i knit all of that together and the answer is very imperfectly tearfully through you know, painful relationships with men, where it, romantically, where I'm like, how am I a feminist and yet not able to take care of myself in this mm. experience of wanting to be loved? Um, like so much of that, mm. my lived experience of feminism feels um, uh, like a glorious, and, and that's funny, it sounds like Gloria. Gloria Steinem is one of my mentors too. <laughs> and, um, you know, she is so helpful to me uh, in terms of, the arc of a life of a woman who has been in the public eye has been uh, objectified, you know, from do, being a reporter, yeah. uh, you know, she was constantly referred to as, and an activist, you know, the gorgeous, the, you know, she, she kind of struggled with her own shrinking in the right. face of how misogyny objectifies and categorizes women. So I watch my, um, my good ancestors for cues as much as I can. And then I kind of, you know, launch myself into what are sometimes blunders. I worry that I've, you know, what if I misgender somebody, you know, like I, this is all in the mix. You know, I, I don't ever want to hear this come out of my mouth, but some of my best friends are trans. Like, how do you talk about, you know, womanhood, cis womanhood, like everything that's in our um, consciousness as people who want to be free women and let other women be free. Be free. That's right. Um, that's, so that really my goal is freedom. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'll share this analogy that I really like. Uh, a plane, even when it's, um, you know, on a flight path, is never actually on its path. It is okay. always course correcting five, five degrees this direction or that direction. Yeah. So this illusion that we will ever 100% be on the beam or be on some perfect path. Mm. I have to let that go because that some, one of my, um, this fabulous woman I work with, Sade Swift, uh, who's an activist and just fantastic young woman of color, black woman. She said to me after a recent performance, um, she said, you know, perfectionism is one of the pillars of patriarchy. White that's supremacy. Right. Yeah. And white supremacy. That's right. You better break it down for your auntie, okay? <laughs> like, I think it's so helpful to be reminded yeah. that that very approach of, was I perfect? Did I get a standing ovation? Was yeah. it fast enough? I remember coming off stage when I was on Broadway, mm. so in my pain that my first thought was, they didn't get up fast enough. To clap. That, they, 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 so standing ovation, I got a standing ovation every right. night. It was a miracle, right? One person out there doing this thing on Broadway, my, my whole name and life, the whole thing. And like you said, there will never be enough. There's never enough approval if you don't approve of yourself. Yes. You will find yourself on a private plane. If somebody's flying you around and all the fancy, amazing things that have been happening in my life that I never thought would happen. And instead of it being able to enjoy it, I was like, it's not my plane. You know? Right. <laughs> what am I going to be satisfied? So that's the idea that requiring perfection of myself, even in terms of how healed I should be by that's now. Right, right. I should be better than this by now. I should, yeah. I should, I should, as they say, you should all over, I'm shooting all over myself. All over myself. Yeah. And yeah. this is, um, this is really, really important. And even, you know, or especially in the context of the work that I do around anti-racism work, this is a conversation that I often have with people who have white privilege that 
please get rid of the idea of perfection. You will not be a perfect ally. You will not be a perfect, you know, non-racist or anti-racist. Um, it is a lifelong journey. And because we are human, complex, beautiful in many ways, very flawed in many ways, that is what your practice is going, is going to look like. And, you know, I get to have amazing conversations on this podcast with amazing people such as, you, such as yourselves who have achieved amazing things in the world, who have become icons, who have become trailblazers, names that we recognize. And what I want everyone who's listening to know is that every guest I have on here is a whole human being. And every single day, there are, vo- there are, you know, not just the voices that talk, that come through Sarah, there are voices inside our head saying, you're not good enough. You didn't do it good enough. You are you failing here? Did you make you know, all of these things? And it's the practice of learning to be with all of those parts of ourselves that make us human. There is no end destination that we have to reach. I think one of the things that I have become, that I've fallen in love with is this un folding of myself, getting to know different parts of myself, see different parts. Oh, I didn't know that was there. I didn't know. I didn't know there was that part of me. And I see that when I see you and these different characters that pop up, it's almost like we get to see an external, you know, an external playing out of different aspects of Sarah that, you know, want expression in different ways. And it, we we get to be the beneficiaries of it because it's out in the world and we have this great power to perform them. But that's also what's going on within many of us. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that embracing rather than, because, you know, with it, there's, I've done like a lot of self-help personal healing work. Uh, so I have a million little phrases that are helpful to me. Some yeah. of which I've, I've learned, you know, over the years and some of which I make up myself but the idea that this is this life is not about self improvement it's about self acceptance yeah. it's about self befriending like right where we are and yeah. if i cannot love all of what's here right now mm. believe me whatever linear progress i'm telling myself i need to make on some imaginary you know whatever olympics i'm competing with myself and other people i will i will wake up you know uh, depleted yeah. Every morning yeah. with a to-do list, uh, there's a uh, thing I've heard, you know, that, that negative voice wakes up a half hour before I do every morning, yeah. cranking out a list of the impossible amount of stuff I need to do. Right. And, uh, you know, if I can just remember I'm whole, I'm, I'm already whole as I am. There's, there is nothing outside me that can confer more value upon me. Yeah. Nothing. And yeah. there's nothing outside me that can take my value away. Mm. If I, when I'm really living from that place, it sets me free. It mm. really does. I don't have to chase you to get the thing that I think will give me more value because I know that that's uh, an illusion. Mm. Now, we live in a society that actually makes money <laughs> from convincing people that's of the right. opposite. So I think we get to give ourselves a lot of credit for just making it through a day, yeah. not harming ourselves like that. I mean, I really, it, it really, it's almost like the Hippocratic oath of living in this society. First do no harm to self or others. And, um, I think self-improvement that this, sometimes the self-improvement language and mm. the industry, the self-improvement industrial complex is a violent, um, you know, means of uh, self-abuse and abuse of others. Right. It really, perpetuates in like children all the way up the myth and the illusion that you are deficient and that something about you needs changing, fixing, improving 24 hours a day. It's just not real, but it is lucrative. It's, it's very lucrative and it's like many industrial complexes steeped in, in white supremacy. Um, This is making me think a lot about how when you, um, when I've seen, so I've seen, you know, one of your TED talks and you just improv the entire thing. And I know. <laughs> yeah, that was a little bit crazy. I just want to say that was, it was, it was the, one of the best things I've ever seen. And it made me think a lot about self-trust, which is a mm-hmm. conversation that I'm currently having with myself. So you're on one of the biggest stages in the world, TED, not TEDx, the TED. Mm-hmm. And 
you have on stage with you a um what do you call it a coat rack coat rack yeah coat rack it's got all these different jackets and hats and things on there you're wearing just you know a black top black trousers so you're you're the blank slate and all of these different props are things that you put on to slip into different characters and the whole premise was you get asked these random questions and then you slip into a character and you you answer the question and it was one of the most fascinating things that I'd ever seen. And as somebody who, like I said, really experienced this idea throughout my lifetime that if you perform, you have to be flawless, perfect, lay every part down. Don't let them see you sweat. Don't let them see you make a mistake. Never improv, you know, <laughs> have it all figured out beforehand or don't bother doing it. Right you just blew my mind because you went on stage and I don't know what your process was behind that. But what I saw was this is somebody who has learned to trust her craft, learned to trust her intuition, learned to trust her voice. And, you know, you say right at the beginning of it, um, this is going to be me kind of um, flying on the seat of my pants and then you said flying on the seat of my ass because I'm not <laughs> I'm not even sure I have the pants right now <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about you know that but also this idea of trusting yourself that you can you can be in any space and and you can tune into that that part of yourself that knows what to do Ah, oh, well, it's like you were there with me, Layla, because I remember doing that TED Talk that I improved. I remember proposing it yeah. to uh, Chris and Jacqueline, Chris Anderson, uh, who owns TED, and uh, his partner, Jacqueline. They're wonderful people, <laughs> you know, wonderful, complicated people like all of us, and uh -huh. they were willing to let me do that. They trusted <laughs> you, yeah. They trusted, me. they trusted me enough to do it. And uh, I also remember. I had done the first, my first TED talk, big, you know, big, big TED. I felt so intimidated. Mm. I really was not standing in my power fully. I had been on Broadway. I had, you know, grossed all these other people a lot of money. <laughs> it didn't come to me, but I, I got, I got some of it. But you know, I was like, I know that I have, I had done whatever movie I had done stuff, and yeah. still the feeling was. This is going to be Bill Gates was speaking and, you know, um, other people who I've since, you know, become friends with Elizabeth Gilbert, uh, Regina Spector, all these people I loved and admired. And I just could see their accomplishments and their shine, but I couldn't, I just felt like I did not measure up and it didn't help that, you know, I was, only, I was like one of the only black people there at the time. Ted was, you know, it was, it's complicated. And I think. Chris and Jacqueline and the TED community would be some of the first people to tell you it's, it's an evolving thing for them to yeah. talk about who belongs and who fits and who gets invited and why. Yeah. And so I think I was feeling self-imposed um, pressure uh, that year. And I like read my thing. If you see the first TED talk and they don't let you read, but I was like, you don't understand. I have to write. And, and you know, cause I needed to be perfect. I needed every word. To I did. I actually did. You're right. I saw that one and stopped watching it and watched another one instead. I remember you had your papers there. I yeah. Had my papers. I was yeah. very nervous. I was very, and, um, I, and, and the tendency to sort of rank people that's, you know, it's left over from my childhood. My dad really had that thing about kind of, you know, white supremacy will make you believe in a, in a hierarchy. Right. And, um, so I think like, and fame and Hollywood, all of that stuff is a really big growth area for me. It's very, very challenging mm. um, to remember that everyone, as you said, grapples with their humanity and that just because some people have a bigger platform does not make them better people. That's a very mm. tricky thing in this culture. Or more healed or, you know. Definitely not yeah. more healed. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I remember being there and feeling that feeling of, you know, fill in the blank, bold faced names are in this audience. I have to be. Uh. And so the next time I made a commitment to myself to do the opposite, let go. I don't care if, you know, whatever people, presidents of countries and all of this are sitting in front of me. Yeah you know, they are going to experience me, the me that's here. And, and, and why was that important to you? Because, because, and, and I asked for this reason, anybody watching your first TED talk, you know, oftentimes this is what I've learned as someone who 
um, has taught, you know, I used to be a corporate trainer. I was a Toastmaster, you know, and I talk a lot in my work. And I, something that I know is that when we see somebody standing up and talking, we're not seeing what's going on behind the scenes at all. We're just like, wow, they have the courage to stand up and talk, something that I'm scared to do. So they're not seeing it from your experience, but you are. And so why was it important for you to make that commitment to yourself? Because it wasn't that commitment wasn't for other people. It was for no. you. It was for me. I yes. was it, so the difference between first Ted and second Ted was yeah. about five years. Mm -hmm. And in that five year period, I went through a, a, a huge life change. I got divorced. Mm -hmm. I was really refinding myself and my purpose and my voice after Broadway and after some experiences in Hollywood that were very confusing to me where I was chasing mm -hmm. the fancy red carpet, blah, blah, blah. I was just like in that world. And it's very, very tempting to be sitting across from all, you know, to be like sleep, having sleepovers with people who were on your lunchbox or whatever when you were right. a little kid. Right. That is confusing. I really, I don't mean to, I don't want to make this smaller than it is. Fame mm -hmm. is a drug. And it, it can kill people. It, kill, it, it has killed. Yes. Many of my good ancestors have lost their battle with that illusion of power. Yeah. That, and yes. often the people who make it to that mountaintop, they do so because they are so consumed with a sense of inadequacy mm -hmm. that they live this fear-driven, you know, kind mm -hmm. of um, race to... Um, it, it, again, to self-improve with fame, right? Yeah. So that was a, the backdrop against which I was really battling for my own soul. It was like, it was so painful to go down that road. I was selling, you know, I would sell a pilot or a TV show here or there or whatever. And, you know, the money's there and the visibility and all of that stuff, being on the cover of magazine, whatever. I had those moments. And, um, and the compare and despair is Awful, awful. Um, again, like you were saying, and the expression I love is comparing my insides to other people's outsides, right? I'm at the party, we're all doing the thing, blah, blah. And I also, I, um, for my own health, I stopped drinking. And when I say health, I mean mental health, emotional health, physical health. I noticed that I was like medicating myself to get through these parties and to, you know, through relationships. And I was like, if I need to take something to get yeah. through intimacy, something's wrong, yeah. right? And I'm, when I, by intimacy, I mean just being seen not just, you know, the concept that people have a lot of the time, but uh, into me see is the yeah. way I've heard. <laughs> really be seen by your loved ones, any yeah. loved ones. So just to get through trying to be who I was, I needed a crutch and I realized that's not going to work for me. So I stopped that and I was looking around in my life at where are my relationships inauthentic? Mm -hmm. Where am I people pleasing and pretending to want to be with people when really you know, I don't like this person or I don't like their values, but because they're powerful and can get me this or that, I'm tolerating crumbs. Right. I'm tolerating a life that isn't nourishing for me. So that five year period of asking myself difficult questions, having to leave behind certain relationships, um, having to really come home to myself and see, oh, this is not the home I really want to be living in. Like th is this home that I've built for myself does not honor me. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's drafty with all this fame chasing and all of this other stuff. Mm. And I want to live in a home that feels like um, fidelity to myself is the most important thing. And I don't mean selfishness. I mean, self attentiveness, self possessed, yeah. um, loving, you know, presence with myself that then is the seed of all of my other relationships. Every other relationship is clouded by my lack of self-love if I don't attend to myself, right? So that's what's behind that TED Talk. If I can love me, even if I come off stage and it wasn't a home run, a perfected, memorized, look at me, I'm going to impress you so you love me mm. moment, what if instead I come out on this stage and say, let's do an experiment. Let's pretend that we are worthy and valuable regardless of the result of this. And let's just see if I have built up the skill set that I think I have to let these characters take over. And in so doing, can I help other people feel like 
not you should go out there and wing it and not be prepared, no. but trust yourself. Like you said, trust right. yourself. And that's the difference. It's not that you, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed the talk and so did my, my husband. And what came across, I think, for both of us, and especially for me, because I have been following your work more, I introduced you to him today, and he's in love now. He's, uh, you know, Sarah Jones Stan now. Um, he wants more. Um, but, you know, as I was watching, I thought, she is such, she is in, she is so at ease here. This is not a perfect performance. It's a real performance. And you kind of, you didn't have to focus on, am I doing the characters right? Because they have, they are such a part of you and you had been, they've been with you for such a long time that you don't have to think even about that part. Did I say the words correctly in the way they would say, was the accent in the right way, was the right mannerisms, but rather it was about playing and yes. being with the audience and being in the moment. And I really appreciated seeing the, um, the, both the brilliance of that and the um, kind of moments of where, does she know where she's going to go next with this? <laughs> By the way, no, I did not know. I really enjoyed that though, I, because it felt like it gave me permission that Layla, Sarah stood on a whole TED stage in front of all of these probably mainly white people and it did this whole performance in the way that she did it. And I love that you ended that performance with the character of the old black woman who you brought on a little bit earlier. I love that you ended it with her and you ended it with such a poignant, poignant message. And it just, it gave me so much permission. And that's why I really want to encourage people to go, to go find the talk. There's, I think, three TED Talks that you've done. Mm -hmm. Go watch them all. See how Sarah is navigated, showing up differently in each one. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I do think that I mean to kind of bring it back around to the work that you know helped me fall in love with you. In a certain way, uh, getting to perform Miss Lady—that's the—that's this person here talk like this. You know, when you live in a culture that devalued who you are, just essentialize you and decide who you are, who you must be. Yeah. Uh, you know, I didn't perform Miss Lady. I, got, I went and performed at the White House for the Obamas when they first got into I mean, like, I've, I've had such incredible peak experiences. And then when I get there, yeah. I'm scared. Right. What if, what if people are think that she's undignified because she is unhoused? You know, she doesn't have a home. Right. And so I try to remember how much um, my own fear can my own fear can block me from authenticity that would actually be of service to people so i try to remember that too the more i can show up authentically and imperfectly the more i give other people permission to do the same to you know paraphrase Marianne williamson a little bit 100 yeah. 100 oh my gosh i love this conversation so so much i could literally talk to you for hours um thank you sarah thank you so much for this how can people follow your work? Um, so we're, so for context, for people who are listening, we are recording this while in the midst of the global pandemic that will forever be known as coronavirus, you know, COVID-19. Um, I'm calling, calling it Crayrona. Crayrona. <laughs> I love it. Crayrona. We're all social distancing. We're in our homes. Where can, you know, what, what are future plans for you? Yeah. So one of the things, and it's funny, I, I want to be mindful um, because even neuronormative, right? Even the ways that we um, need more humanity around how we look at mental health. I'm conscious that as a writer, I'm always saying things like Cray and this and that. And um, so I just want to acknowledge that even that is a frontier where, where I'm working. And you can find me working my stuff out and, um, you know, hopefully evolving um, on social media. This sounds like a contradiction in terms, but that's where I'm doing my evolution right now because I can't see other human beings closer than six feet. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, yes, I'm Sarah Jones on all of the social platforms. Um, well, you'll spell it out, Layla, hopefully. But we'll it's yes. Don't worry, we'll take care of it. And for so, the, those listening after post corona, knock on wood. Yeah, yeah we'll, knock on wood. Uh, what are your future plans that we can get excited about? Future plans. So, one of the things I'm excited about is one of my one person shows is called Sell by Date, mm -hmm. and it's about 
the future, but it's a longer conversation for another podcast with you, Layla. But uh, people can follow, if they follow my socials, we are working on a documentary mm-hmm. project um, with some very exciting uh, executive producers whose names I won't say now in the spirit of not needing to focus on famous people, but there's some <laughs> very exciting collaboration happening there. And I'm uh, continuing to work on some new projects for my one person shows that are going to be able to reach more people um, across platforms. So definitely stay in touch about that. Amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. So to, to, to close us out, our final question. Yes. What does it mean to you to be a good ancestor? Yes. So I think in the same spirit as we started, right. Thinking about, um, the complexity of a good ancestor, the, that, that a good ancestor is a big enough container to hold multiple experiences at the same time, mm-hmm. pain and joy and self-exploration that can be painful and crunchy. Um, I want to um, be on a continuous journey of, um, you know, kind of self-exploration, self-discovery that is loving and that is gentle and that is kind and that enables me to have self-compassion at a deep level that then uh, kind of fuels my compassion for other people, even people who, you know, I won't do any impressions right now, but let's just say there's a lot of people that it's hard for me to have compassion for at times. Mm. But when I'm in that good ancestor space, I can remind myself they are doing the best they can with what they have. Um, And my job is to keep my heart open. Remember that, uh, you know, we are all, we're one organism, really. If if this COVID, if this Crayrona has taught me anything. Anything that we are not separate. We are all one. And as reductive and corny as that can sound, it is true. It is true. And so I must love, I must practice loving myself so that I stay in the flow of loving all of us. Mm. Yeah. I love that. Thank you, Sarah. Thank Thank you. you. Love you. Thank Thank you for that. This is Leila Saad, and you've been listening to Good Ancestor Podcast. I hope this episode has helped you find deeper answers on what being a good ancestor means to you. We'd love to have you join the Good Ancestor podcast family over on Patreon, where subscribers get early access to new episodes, patron-only content and discussions, and special bonuses. Join us now at patreon.com forward slash good ancestor podcast. Thank you for listening, and thank you for being a good ancestor.